We're about ready to get started. Um, a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, this is for those of you who are working on GN and C for your projects. Um, I've spoke with uh, Phil Haddis from Draper Lab, who's going to be giving the lecture on GN and C, but he's not giving the lecture until the third of November. Now that's kind of late, and so I asked him if he would be willing uh, to meet with all of you who were working on GNNC just so you could talk with him, ask questions, um, you know, if you want him to give you a short version of his presentation that he's going to give in November, he can do that. But, um, you know, he, he's our in-house resident expert, and I figured it it's better if you get a chance to talk to him early. So um, he, is, he has some time free tomorrow, and he has some time next week. He's, he's out of town through today but if uh, I know we have two teams working on GNNC if if you guys want to get together and find out if there's some time when you could all meet with Phil uh, I'll give you his contact information he says he's happy to do it it would be much more convenient from his point of view if you could all see him at the same time and, and talk about it together okay um, so let me know what what you come up with but uh, as I say he's happy to do it um, second thing um, there was a, an interview printed in USA Today, which I've, I've posted on the class website with Mike Griffin, the administrator, uh, and it says, NASA administrator says space shuttle was a mistake. And so the, the question was, you know, what, what do we intend to do about that in this class? Well, let me actually read the specific words that Griffin uses, because I think that's important. Um, Griffin said, my opinion is that the shuttle was a design which was extremely aggressive and just barely possible. Um, and, and that's actually, I think, a slightly different uh, way of looking at this. I mean, I would also say that Apollo was a, was a uh, project which was extremely aggressive and just barely possible. And I think that it's actually NASA's business to do things which are aggressive and just barely possible. Now, whether, whether it was the right decision for the country to abandon the exploration program after Apollo and and do the shuttle and then later on the space station that's more in the I think in the political realm and, and as I think you've heard uh, both from Dale Myers and, and John Logston that um, in, in fact there were political determining factors which in fact which didn't really give NASA a lot of choice um, just to remind you the the basic point of this course is is not the political uh, and economic history of the shuttle it's a technical exploration of how we did the shuttle so I think we would all agree that the the concept of the shuttle was extremely aggressive and the technology was being stretched and it, and it was just barely possible and yet we did it and the, the idea of this course is to understand how we did it and how the systems work. I think it will be interesting uh, when we get towards the end of the course, you know, maybe we'll sit down and, and relax and, and instead of having, I think we, there's, there's two kind of open sessions towards the end that I've been thinking about what we want to do there. And, and in one of them, I think we, we maybe just talk a little bit and reflect on, on what we've learned and, and that'll give us an opportunity to, to discuss uh, issues like this. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about this. I, I don't propose that we, we discuss this further today because we really uh, are, are fortunate to have, have Bass read and, and uh, Aaron Cohn is going to introduce him formally. I, I'll just say that um, when I was at Johnson Space Center last spring and, and I met uh, one of the, the older managers there and I, I was telling him about our plans for this course and how Aaron was going to be a visiting professor here and we were inviting some of the, the experts in the early design of the shuttle and he said well there's one guy you absolutely have to get and that's Bass Red. Well we've got him. We're very very fortunate and uh, Aaron I'll turn it over to you and, and let you explain a little bit more why we're so fortunate. Well I'm fortunate 
first I have to tell you uh, how I found bass. I had a, had a hard time finding bass. He lives in a place called Smithville, Texas. In Smithville, Texas, he said, when people ask him where Smithville, Texas is, he said it's it's about a few minutes after you pass resume speed. So it's not it's not a very well known place. But I finally found bass, and he is truly an outstanding aerodynamicist. And the thing that's so important is that aerodynamics, to me, is, from my vantage point, is really the linchpin, you might say, of putting a system together. Aerodynamics makes the system come alive. And as you could hear from the various speakers, from uh, Tom Moser, and, from, uh, and we talked a little bit about the guidance, navigation, and control, it's important for the structures. Aerodynamics is important for the structures. It's important for the flight control system. It's important for the hydraulic system. It's important for the heating system. So you have to do aerodynamics. You have to understand the aerodynamics before you can make the vehicle actually uh, come alive. And Bass Red is the man to do it. He is absolutely one of the great aerodynamicists of our times. And he, he started out before there was computational fluid dynamics in the old wind tunnel testing. And now there's computational fluid dynamics. So you're going to be in for a real treat today to hear how Bass Red put both the Apollo together, he did the Apollo aerodynamics, and he also did the uh, shuttle aerodynamics. And he's also now consulting to help NASA uh, do their uh, future work. So let me now turn it over to, to Bass. Thank you, Aaron. It's a great honor to be with you this morning, and you sure do look young. <laughs> uh, we'll try to cover basically the um, vehicle and with that overview then the orbiter is how the program requirements drove the aerodynamic configuration um, probably the biggest thing and what the aerodynamic characteristics are driven by the program requirements and that'll make a little more sense after we get into the briefing uh, then the aerodynamic considerations, those that uh, aren't due to program requirements, but just due to the basic fundamentals of aerodynamics and the configuration that's being evaluated. We'll do that for both the orbiter and the integrated vehicle. And uh, then I'll try to tell you how the aerodynamic design was accomplished through each of those phases. Uh, a lot of ways to work problems. Um, uh, early on, having powerful tools are sometimes a curse to you because you can produce more data than the system can consume. And uh, I remember when we first got started uh, on the uh, shuttle design is the people from Structures had just finished the NASTRAN uh, on the Apollo and they immediately wanted enough data to put into the NASTRAN for every configuration that was being conceived. That's not really a smart thing to do uh, when you have literally hundreds of configurations to be considered. So we'll, we'll try to talk to you about uh, by phases, phase A, B, and C, and defining the problem areas and then defining the aerodynamic characteristics and do just a quick summary of the wind tunnel test program and with some comments on how CFD might have driven that were it available. So the 60s, 80s, these design studies were accomplished in phases. Phase A is primarily in-house civil service design. Uh, I don't know how well you understand the, the NASA part, what the contractor part is, what the civil service part is, uh, but phase A is primarily in-house civil service, but uh, whenever the contractors begin to feel that, hey, this might be a real program, uh, 
they began to do their in-house studies and they began to visit and give us recommendations and and uh, ideas on their own to to drive that nothing of that is paid for that's a, a gratis kind of a thing and uh, there's in contractors they have a bit of change set aside for uh, to do those kinds of studies but it's a uh, freebie and and really a, a super way to do things and uh, that's still going on today phase B uh, is then you give contracts for generic studies uh, scopes out the concept feasibilities and uh, the program requirements and does those trades uh, does projected cost and timelines uh, by the way before I forget it Humboldt Mandel on costing would be an excellent uh, to have you good uh, we work quite close hand in hand on trying to get those how uh, requirements and and costs run together along with the weight so NASA then after they get through this phase B they, they produce a detailed uh, statement of work that uh, 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 is required for the phase C and D and then phase C and D is uh, uh, the design and development uh, Air Force separated those two NASA always sort of put those together so there's design and development and construction and the contractors do the detail work uh, NASA manages and checks it uh, usually the way we operate at least in our area in the aerodynamic area we had a crack team that would go back in and uh, define the problem a potential solution to that problem and uh, uh, then suggest to the contractor they might look at it this way or that way but they really put the muscle to it they put the final studies they have the design documentation and uh, we try to steer that train uh, uh, as those things happen uh, in the shuttle now phase A we started in 1969 just shortly after the lunar landing they put together a small team this is at Johnson Spacecraft Center and that's through my knot hole and uh, the way that I look at things but we did end up being the uh, lead center in the shuttle but we started with a small uh, E&D group uh, that was headed by the name of a fellow by the name of Jim Chamberlain Jim Chamberlain was the one that uh, was responsible for the Gemini spacecraft very unique individual uh, uh, gone to heaven to be with the Lord now uh, <laughs> reviewed by Max Fige who was head of E&D and Bob Gilruth who was center director but uh, uh, that was a real privilege to work with them. What, what came out of that initial phase A study is what the vehicle should be is a small personnel vehicle uh, with a four-man crew, 10K payload, landing on the runway with about 200 nautical miles cross range. Uh, quite different from the shuttle that we have today but that was during the phase A strong design modules in this time were developed uh, and showing how the other the program requirements drove the design the size and the program cost uh, uh, there were individuals that had uh, uh, in their data bank which consisted of books that they kept on their uh, their tables were all of the aircraft all of the spacecraft all of the missiles uh, what the weight of every individual subsystem was uh, based upon plots with uh, uh, ECLS's on uh, how much heat they took out on the avionics as to uh, how many computations they made and uh, I will not chase that rabbit too far but but basically they were down to a subsystem kind of level and then with a primary structure secondary structure how that was affected by landed weights or entry weights the thermal protection system and it was amazing uh, uh, what a good job that kind of approach would do and then we had point designs that were being looked at both in-house at Johnson Spacecraft Center at Marshall and by all the contractors and then all that data was fed into the system so there was a design database some of those have been automated now and uh, uh, pretty good and they don't give you the right answers but the answers they give you aren't very far wrong either uh, get get into the ballpark for you uh, phase B started in 1971 uh, something happened uh, the requirements was not dictated by NASA 
the requirements were dictated by the Air Force, at least the driving requirements. We had our own. A small vehicle would have satisfied that. Uh, the Air Force requirements were 55,000 pound payload, uh, 60 foot long payload bay, 15 foot in diameter. It had to be returned with a 1,200 nautical mile cost range, at least 32,000 pounds of it had to be returned. Uh, it was classified at that time. It's no longer classified. You can use your, inf your imagination to figure out what kind of payload that you'd want to go up into a high inclination orbit and bring back in one pass where, you, to where that would take you and why you'd have to get back that quickly. But those were the requirements that were fed into phase B. Uh, maximum reusability did not come from the Air Force. That came from the NASA side as that was part of technology. NASA has two basic jobs to do. One is the uh, design of the vehicle, the delivering of the hardware, accomplishing the mission. But the other requirement for NASA is that it increase the technology, uh, going where no man's gone before, yes, but doing things that man's not done before in a better, faster way. And uh, uh, so maximum reusability uh, was a goal that the engineers were handed. Uh, soft ride, uh, they wanted to be able to take a congressman or a senator up in it. Uh, neat, neat thing. Uh, uh, Multi-center participation. Uh, if you ever get hum up here, uh, that costs you. Anytime you break a job down and give it to more than one center or more than one contractor, it's like Humpty Dumpty. You break him apart, you got to put him back together again, and it takes a lot of eyes and elbows on both sides to accomplish that. And basically, once you break something down, you've increased your cost by 30 to 40 percent to put it back together again. Now, uh, NASA has to have under congressional mandate contracts in every state in the union okay so multi-center participation uh, drives a great number of things so I felt it needed to uh, be on the chart uh, but uh, the big thing that you need to know as engineers uh, Sometimes you can't set your own program requirements. They're dictated to you for strange reasons and, and you have to play the hand that you're dealt. Uh, phase C and D. Uh, we had four contractors that bid on Phase C and D. Uh, the interesting thing is Rockwell was the only contractor that bid within the allocated funds. Uh, they also had the best proposal. Uh, but that was very interesting. Uh, what they did is they used the aerodynamic database that was developed in Phase A and Phase B for their design analysis. They augmented that. They did some in-house testing. And Rockwell said, we can do it for that amount of money, uh, but only if you don't change anything, NASA. And uh, we changed things. Uh, 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 they had a smaller orbiter, and we rejected that very early on. It had no capability for weight growth, and we showed that every program that's ever existed grew in weight by at least 5, 10, 15 percent. And so the orbiter was sized up just a little bit larger than the one that they had proposed with their agreement. Uh, and Aaron probably had a contract change authorization because of that. But anyway, we did that right at the beginning. Uh, what we did also aerodynamic during that phase B is we developed a complete database uh, uh, in the nation's best facility to be used for what we call verification analyses and and uh, uh, that uh, database um, uh, is very well documented and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, program requirements uh, Trying to uh, yes. Requirements, could you say something about kind of the state of the? You talked about the aerodynamic data. Yes, uh -huh. but you, you know nowadays, uh, you know we've, we've got a lot of information about hypersonic aerodynamics. Yes. Can you say a little bit about the state of the art? 
Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm going to do that when we go through it by phases specifically. Okay. I'm kind of telling it to you like a mystery story. <laughs> uh, the program requirements dictated the basic orbiter configuration, payload size, crew size, uh, and, and returning the payload bay, the engine. Now, if you just visualize in your mind, and it's kind of a two-chart thing, let me just jump over to that since I know how to go back now. Uh, if you've got a payload that's got to be that long and you've got a crew size and the crew takes at least one telephone booth's worth of volume per crew, uh, even Superman needed something that big. So uh, you've got the volume of this. Uh, engines in the back, you want to return that because engines are very, very expensive. The avionics, of course, you want to bring those back. They're very, very expensive. And and this part, and you got to have it pointy in first, okay? Uh, so you look at that and you said, boy, you didn't have much choice choice as far as the fuselage was concerned and that's right you really don't now uh, so that's that's pretty well set now uh, the wing size is required to augment the body lift. Now, if you just had the body on there, it would have to land about 300 knots. Uh, we didn't have wheel, tires, and brakes to land at those speeds, so we had to have some more lift, and uh, uh, that was accommodated uh, with a wing. Figure out what CL Max is, they're all about the same. You like a Delta wing because it's a little more nice from a heat transfer standpoint. Sure, a whole lot nicer is you got to go through supersonic and transonic conditions at uh, low angles of attack. So you, you, you've got a Delta wing that you want to have on there. You don't have much choice on that. The size of that, it's clockwise, uh, airfoil by the way, 12% thick, that makes it nice for the structures. People still does a super job aerodynamically too. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, pretty well dictated. Uh, then the entry angle of attack is dictated by the hypersonic L over D required for the cross range. And you can go through your equations, Newtonian aerodynamics, uh, sine of the exposed area, and then the L over D, the tangents. And, and, and so y you've got the hypersonic aerodynamics from that angle of attack required for the cross range. The wing shape to balance the configuration for the FCG and acceptable wing leading edge heating. In other words, we can position that wing at the right place for the center of gravity that we have, which by the way, even in phase A is known pretty well, didn't change much. The control surfaces uh, was the magic thing. Uh, uh, with the payload in and out, one and a half percent CG change. Uh, there's only been one other vehicle, aerodynamic vehicle, that's ever been built that has a CG of one and a half percent of body length. That was a B-36. Uh, and this vehicle had to have the one and a half percent change in center of gravity because of payload in, payload out, and you can try to stack it together in many different ways. That's just as good as you can do. Is That dictated the size of the control services to accommodate that. Uh, they're very big. They're barn doors. Uh, uh, makes it nice for controlling the vehicle. So then all of a sudden, you oh, and the vertical tail, we'll talk about that. That's for crosswind landings. By the way, uh, most all the vehicles that you've seen from overseas that have been proposed can't land when a crosswind. I don't know what they're going to do. They, they don't have enough control service to land in the crosswind. Uh, but that dictated the vertical tail size. Now, as you kind of go around the loop on those things, some potential uh, items that we probably want to point out here is body shape we've already basically talked about. No shape, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, uh, basic orbiter shape didn't really change from phase A through phase C and D. All we blunted the ohms pot a little bit because we didn't want it to uh, interfere with the payload bay door which was built by a different uh, uh, set of groups. Uh, the delta wing, we put a little crank in it, a double delta, uh, got a little more subsonic lift and uh, we didn't have the body flap moving to start with but we found that it was a very powerful controller which is assisted the uh, uh, center of gravity movement. Um, 
the full spanned elevons uh, uh, were needed to control the center of pressure for hypersonics. And there's other little things there, and you can read those through at your convenience, but those are just basic things that you, uh, you have to do, and we'll comment on some of those a little bit later. The integrated vehicle, the launch vehicle, if you please. Uh, what did the program requirements do to it? Well, uh, the orbiter was sized for that payload bay weight. It had to land, it had to enter. We knew the weights pretty well. Uh, the 150k pound uh, uh, orbiter, 65k pound payload dictated the requirements of the orbiter injected weight. You add them up, you got to get it into orbit. Uh, once around at the high inclination and returned to the launch site, said the orbiter performance requirements. We had to have uh, a certain amount of energy available from the propulsion system. Maximum hardware reusability mixed with the cost consideration yielded a stage and a half vehicle. And I'll talk to you about that in, in just a minute. But the cost constraints, uh, there was a great move afoot to have a return to uh, uh, the launch site booster, man booster, if you please. Uh, but the costing constraints and the size of the vehicle had got pretty big. Uh, the uh, wing vehicle loads were significantly reduced by the parallel burn. Uh, you've got the orbiter uh, tucked in between the solid rocket boosters in the external tank versus an orbiter that would be on the end uh, makes a great difference uh, in the structural loads that the aerodynamics produce. Solid rocket booster mismatch decreased or, or dictated an increased beta dispersion. Uh, typically uh, on an end-to-end -end vehicle, uh, you've got everything kind of tucked in pretty tightly on this one. The SRBs are spread, any mismatch at burnout, we had some big beta dispersions. Still haunt us a little bit today. Uh, soft ride requirement. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Don't know what a beta dispersion is. Don't know what a beta dispersion is. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> angle of attack. All right. Angle of attack. Angle of side slip beta. Okay. Okay. So, alpha, beta, oh, standard, the, standard uh, aerodynamic definition. Which, by the way, brings me to a, a comment. Let me. Uh, we've been asked to uh, chase a rabbit with you here. I would suggest very highly that you get you a NASA dictionary, okay, uh, where standard terms uh, that your bosses <laughs> will use because they've been using them for years. That that you do that, and not 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 fussing at you at all, but but uh, uh, that that and you can get that little gray book, and it's called a NASA dictionary. And you know what alphas, betas are, CMQ plus CM alpha dots. All those standard terms are defined. Flutter. Uh, Buffett, uh, those kind, of, and and you really look sharp when you know what he's saying. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, so, just, go ahead. I mean, I, I know there, there's some people here who didn't go through Aero Astro and, and so may have actually not had a full course in aerodynamics. Hopefully, most of you have had it. But yeah, any any time there's expressions or terms you don't understand, Absolutely. Just, yeah. just do ask, and we'll, yeah. we'll bring you up to speed. No. And that NASA dictionary, by the way, uh, covers not just aerodynamics, it covers all kinds of other vocabulary kinds of things that your peers will be using and your supervisors will be using and, and you know what they're talking about. Uh, soft ride requirements, uh, that caused us to go to a real low dynamic pressure, which is nice. Uh, most vehicles are up around 1,200 pounds per square foot dynamic pressure. This one is down around 800. And uh, the reason that came about is lesser G loads early on. Uh, SRB flare angle, no big deal there. Uh, plume effects have uh, really ate up aerodynamics. To this day, that's the only thing aerodynamically that we still don't know how to predict are the base pressures due to plume effects through the subsonic and supersonic speed regime. Uh, CFD gets it right every now and then. Uh, sometimes it doesn't get it right. Uh, uh, so, And the wind tunnel test uh, still hadn't got it right with solid plumes. Uh, all the scaling parameters that you use uh, uh, still doesn't produce uh, to me what are real valid answers. The flight data is used and we update that yes sir. You say flare angle you mean like in the stack away from the orbit? 
uh, yesterday, this flare angle right back here. Uh, we, we found that if you set that right, uh, that it pretty well sets the flow and the plumes behave themselves. If you set that too small, uh, the plumes will change greatly with Mach number, sometimes in an unpredictable fashion. Uh, so that was that SRB skirt size uh, was uh, primarily from that consideration. Um, <laughs> this is real precious to Aaron's heart. Uh, we changed the tank shape early in phase C and D. And remember I told you that we had developed a database during phase B uh, that would suffice and we could go immediately into the uh, design and development of the total stack and uh, uh, that uh, shape, by, by the way I like the ogive, it's a lot prettier than the cone that we had on the front end. But basically what that did, that changed the aerodynamics of the whole stack and the data that was delivered to structure for the structural analysis the data that were delivered to the heating people for the heat transfer analysis had to be done all over again. That's a year and a half cycle. From the time you say, let's go build a model, let's get the data, <clears throat> let's analyze it. Um, the other thing, <clears throat> the other thing that happened uh, when we changed the uh, tank, Everybody took note of that, and there's all kind of other small changes that jumped on. <laughs> on the orbiter a little bit, uh, on the uh, external tank, uh, uh, on the SRBs, and on the inclination uh, that we had uh, between the orbiter and the tank. Uh, let me just hit uh, some things I think that you want to take note of on this one. And, um, I guess the nose shape, we've mentioned that one already, reduces the drag. Uh, it also reduces the loads. We have to worry about the punch loads between the SRB and the tank, and those aerodynamics are driven quite a bit by that nose shape. Uh, the uh, uh, SRB locations, fore and aft, there's some adjustment that you can have in that, and those are all optimized. Uh, uh, that uh, Whenever we do the aerodynamics, that puts a minimum amount of load into the system. Um, orbiter instance angle, that's that angle between the orbiter and the external tank. Uh, drives the stability of the configuration to some degree, but more than that it drove the loads quite a bit into the program and that was optimized. Uh, full span elevators, we use those to uh, adjust the pitching moment so we get minimum change required to trim the vehicle from the SRBs solid rocket boosters and the SSMEs, the main main shuttle engines. Um, SSEME plume effects and the plume effects from the SRB, uh, that's the only thing that we got a bad grade on as far as predicting aerodynamics on either the orbiter uh, or the uh, uh, integrated vehicle, all the rest of the stuff came out just about as we, we had predicted. Now, getting back to where you asked the question, phase A, okay, go back now, what is a phase A? That's the conceptual design. We had all kind of configurations because we had all kind of requirements. We really didn't know what those were. And, and so that analysis had to be done. Many, many vehicles, a lot of considerations. Uh, the analytical techniques we used to identify problem areas. Hypersonics, quite frankly, in phase A, uh, Newtonian uh, vehicle shape was approximated with flat plates. Uh, Works great <laughs> on a configuration that's pretty much like a vehicle that's kind of trimmed out of a piece of a sphere, if you please. And uh, uh, those aerodynamic characteristics uh, were very good. Uh, uh, 
as a matter of fact, the thing is laid out on graph paper and you counted the squares and saw where the CG was and what things had to be, and, and it worked. It worked. Uh, now, we didn't know that it was working at that time, but we found out later that it did. But that, that's, what, well, that's what we use, okay. Uh, NASA documentation. Uh, uh, NASA had uh, pretty good TNs on vehicles that were somewhat similar, and the characteristics of those, we made the adjustments because of the difference in configuration. Uh, the Air Force uh, uh, had a, uh, a document called Data Man. It was unpublished at that time, uh, but we got a preliminary draft that we worked through by hands. By the way, this is a published thing I'd suggest very highly if aerodynamics is going to be your forte is that you learn how to use that program. It's uh, uh, Data Man Aerodynamics Handbook. Naval Ordnance had a handbook out. They've never uh, uh, computerized theirs, uh, but it's a handbook of supersonic aerodynamics and good old Horner's Fluid Dynamics Lift and Drag. Uh, still around today. Uh, still use it. Uh, but those were the aerodynamic methods that we used during phase day. Uh, and we also did small scale wind tunnel tests and those things that were the problem areas. And the problem areas were uh, primarily in the transition area. Yes, sir. Can I ask, um, I can understand how you can um, do wind tunnel testing. What about fluid effects? You said you didn't understand those. How did you test those experimentally? Did you set up a big, uh, uh, big test rocket? Uh, no, uh, that's done in a wind tunnel. And uh, uh, what we do, <clears throat> some people said you need to match momentum <clears throat> on a scale vehicle. That's this in the water. Thank you. Some are certain uh, other characteristics. Uh, what you like to do is be able to simulate it with a solid plume. So we did solid plume testing using, we had method of characteristics back then. It took it about three weeks to run, okay, to get the plume sizes, and, and it did a pretty good job. But when you have the plume sizes, you still, after the base effects, changing the pitching moment. And so we did the solid plumes, then we did gaseous plumes at uh, Ames Research Center. We did cold gas and hot gas. But none of those may, all the scaling parameters, when you roll all that up and you did the best you could, we still miss base pressure. The base pressure was missed on Saturn V. Base pressure was missed on Mercury. Uh, base pressure was missed on uh, Little Joe 2, Little Joe 1. Every launch vehicle that I could find, we missed base pressure on. We missed miss base pressure on the uh, uh, the shuttle also. Not a big effect, but it's embarrassing that you can't get it right. And uh, 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 but uh, this this was done primarily more in Phase B. Uh, excuse me, phase C and D, then in the phase A time period, uh, uh, we just kind of said, hey, plumes are going to be about that much based upon uh, data from other vehicles, and then uh, uh, make for sure that it was not a design driver or a design stopper, if you please, that it wasn't going to be a problem that was so big that it, it changed things so greatly that your performance wasn't adequate, and we had margins and everything, but uh, anyway, we did some small-scale testing. Uh, phase B, what did we do on the shuttle on phase B? Well, there we went into phase B with, with four major configurations. Uh, uh, three externally identical configuration with swing wings. It was called the Trimese. I think General Dynamics was the one that proposed that one. You, you can't, they all have bought one another and it's hard to find out who's who any longer. Uh, but anyway, that was one of the concepts. Uh, uh, very, very expensive. Uh, the swing wings uh, never really solved those problems. Uh, Lockheed had a large single stage blended body, uh, kind of an HL-10 looking thing with a flat bottom and then with a large external tank around and I couldn't find pictures of all this to show you but that, that was one that came in. And then the two stage fully reusable with both the first and the second stage as being runway landers, very favorite of Marshall. And then uh, the one that we call the stage and a half where you're literally burning the first stage boosters and the second stage engines at the same time 
uh, with the external tank, and we refer to that as a uh, stage and a half with parallel burn, which is the current shuttle. But those are the things that we started phase B in and did aerodynamic designs on all those. Uh, how did we do that? Well, we'd gotten a little smarter. A lot of the Newtonian programs had now been uh, uh, automated. It was still pretty much a flat plate kind of a program, though, where you divided the vehicle up into a number of flat plates. And uh, then there was some contractor in-house wind tunnel tests. NASA did uh, some limited tests on potential problem areas. Uh, post phase B and pre phase C and D. Uh, that was a gap between the time we put out an RFP request for a proposal and the time that the contractors came back with a proposal. We had narrowed it down that hey it would be a stage and a half that would be what we would write the RFP for. So we developed uh, a large wind tunnel test program, developed a full aerodynamic database and heating database for that shuttle that was there at that time that was delivered to the contractors that were going to bid on that. Integrated vehicle, um, we used the USF Stability and Control BATCOM. Uh, some contractor wind tunnel tests uh, uh, were done and limited NASA testing and analysis for potential problem areas. And uh, this also, we did a post phase B full aerodynamic data base for that vehicle. Now, with that, all we're trying to do is to eliminate configuration changes, uh, uh, if at all possible, and, and uh, uh, we accomplish that to some degree. Uh, but the change to the tank and other changes came back in that caused us some delay, but it was minimized. Phase C and D. Configuration was baseline. Big word here, make work changes only. Nothing's changed because it looks better, works better, uh, you gotta change it or it'll crash. Uh, that's what we said, that's not what we did. Uh, we, we made some changes because they were nice. Uh, theoretical aerodynamic techniques were employed to assure you never get to test at the right Reynolds number. Henceforth, your boundary layer is a little bit wrong. Plume effects, uh, uh, they've got to be corrected. So there was a lot of analytical work that was done during that phase C and D. Uh, let, let me say this is that area of our technology was uh, 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 really improved. A lot of dollars that went into that, Aaron's courtesy that the program probably didn't need to fly the shuttle, but for the benefit of... Now you tell him. Now I tell him. I didn't tell him that then, you're right. <laughs> but for the benefit of technology, we, we did that. We, we pumped great money into CFD, great money into method of characteristics, a lot of money into uh, other techniques that were there, uh, and uh, once more, NASA goals not only to do that mission but to help technology and the reason you can do CFD today was because the dollars that that shuttle program pumped into that had they not pumped that in you'd, you'd still be adding up flat plates okay <laughs> aerodynamic variations and uncertainty were developed for all aerodynamic coefficients uh, uh, no other vehicle had really done that you, you sort of did the best that you could and say okay these are my aerodynamic this is my normal force Force versus angle of attack. This is my uh, C side force coefficients, yawing moment coefficients versus beta, uh, and uh, uh, that's it. And then you would analyze that, give that to the flight control system, give that to the structures people. Uh, they'd put their margins of safety in and look at it. Uh, we were quite concerned on this vehicle, especially when it starts out at a 45 degree angle of attack and sometimes during the supersonic and transonic regime it transits down to a low angle of attack. Flow is separated, 
someplace in there it reattaches it can't always make up its mind you've got to be able to control the vehicle even though we weren't intentionally maneuvering at that time and so uh, we developed these variations if you go back in the tunnel three times you get what four different answers <laughs> and they're all very very close uh, if you change facilities you get slightly different answers we we know that we had some Reynolds number boundary layer kinds of problems between the wind tunnel and the full scale and so these uncertainties were developed for all the aerodynamic coefficients uh, then this data was delivered uh, to the GN and C people uh, where they make for sure that they can fly their system with the uncertainties, the CN betas, uh, yaw moment coefficient with the angle of side slip, uh, the control moment coefficients, the delta yawing moments and rolling moments due to elevon maneuvers with the errors on those uh, that the control system wouldn't go berserk with any combination of those. Uh, same with structures and with flight dynamics. Uh, now, uh, we're not living with those today. We, we did flight tests to reduce the variations. Uh, the astronauts put in PTIs, pilot test inputs, uh, where they would do it a certain way and we would pre-predict those characteristics, then we'd look at them post-flight. We would pull the aerodynamic characteristics out with uh, uh, regression analysis techniques uh, to say this is the aerodynamic coefficients that had to be there for that maneuver to look like it looked that within itself has some plus or minus stuff because you can change stuff a little bit and it still looks pretty good. Uh, those two then were combined and we had a set of reduced aerodynamics. But today when you go to the aerodynamic data book, uh, which we hope to be able to get you copies of, it will have not only the coefficients uh, for all Mach numbers, angles of attack, angle of side slip, it will tell you what the uncertainty as a function of Mach number angle of attack is for that and your system should be able to work with all those. Um, I want to mention this aerodynamic design substantiation report. You won't be able to get a copy of that um, any place that I know of, but we're going to try to get a copy to, uh, to Jeff for you and should be available in your files. But what that did, that goes back in and for every coefficient, every angle of attack, how we arrived at that specific value and those specific variations using both wind tunnel and flight test uh, and a super document, uh, not pretty, uh, but an excellent technical document and uh, uh, that was done uh, during the flight test program and, and afterwards. Uh, I thought we'd uh, stick up there, the wind tunnel testing program, that, that's primarily the backbone of the aerodynamic database of the shuttle both for the orbiter and the integrated vehicle. Um, 149 entry tests on the entry vehicle, 79 heating, 40 structural, uh, you can add them up, hours of wind tunnel test time, 17,000. Uh, Aaron asked me how that compared with the Apollo. As best I remember, we did about uh, four to 5,000 hours on the entry vehicle uh, on Apollo. However, uh, Apollo didn't have all of those movable surfaces. Movable surfaces are nice, uh, do a lot of things for you, but you got to test to uh, make sure they're there. And those were through various wind tunnels throughout the country. Yes, sir. Yes, these are the best facilities in the country. Do they still exist? Uh, far up in a way, Yes, sir, they still exist. Uh, uh, the ones at Ames are still usable. The ones at AEDC are still usable. Unfortunately, those at Langley, even though they're there and they work uh, because of funding constraints, uh, Langley has a hard time bringing them up and using them. And that's unfortunate uh, because we have some excellent facilities there. And it was surely used in that. And we've got in this uh, wind tunnel test program, you can find out uh, uh, spatial wind tunnel testing program summary uh, that's uh, that by the way you can get this document pretty straightforwardly uh, entry via excuse me ascent vehicle a uh, few less hours and that's because you don't move as many surfaces primarily uh, heating uh, that's something to work on if you want a good project to work on uh, how do you take heating data in a wind tunnel on 
a small scale vehicle and make full scale predictions. Uh, the reason that's near and dear to my heart, uh, they ran a test not too long ago and they still can't match those two. So, uh, good PhD thesis. <laughs> Maybe you can figure out how to do that and how to do it right. A lot of scaling parameters that are used kind of like plumes. Uh, you're not sure which scaling parameter really really works. But there's flight test data, calorimeters, uh, uh, and there's flight test data, uh, and wind tunnel data, and uh, a lot of, about, about it doesn't doesn't bother us that much because we've got enough conservatism in the system and uncertainties uh, that we know we're safe to fly. But it does hurt your pride when you said, hey, that heating rate is uh, should be 9 BTUs per foot squared per second and the flight test data said it's not but 2. Uh, you don't you might look good one way, you look bad another way, but that, that, if I was looking for something to uh, get my plow into and I was interested in theoretical stuff, that's probably where I'd, I'd pick. Uh, total wind tunnel test program, uh, uh, Aaron paid for that out of his budget, by the way, uh, uh, was uh, less than $100 million <laughs> in those year dollars. Uh, but it, it was an excellent program. Uh, every test that was conducted was documented, analyzed, and uh, uh, we can make that available. So that uh, concludes the uh, things that I had uh, to tell you, and uh, we hit that hour just about right. Uh, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? If not, I'll give you a test. Yes, sir. How how does your how do we affect the trim? Yeah. How, how do you like? How do you assess the? How did you assess the control surface? Because it's a data wing, it has to generate control as, as, as well as stability. So, so you only have one surface to do all that, and so I was wondering how how difficult. Okay. Hypersonics. And when I say hypersonic, let me take it down to Mark 5, uh, was probably the best at prediction that we had. Uh, a flat plate, which the belly of the orbiter has a little bit of surface bending both in the pitch plane and in the yaw plane for, for stability. If you put a big sphere or segment of a sphere, you could place the orbiter on that and you'd see, yeah, hey, so I, and I know a sphere or segment of a sphere has stability. Now, uh, the uncertainties turn out not to be in normal forces or even side forces. Uh, pitching moment is the one that you tend to, to, to miss the most. And sometimes you don't know if you have a wrong pitching moment or a wrong center of gravity. They, they both precipitate a delta pitching moment coefficient change. Uh, the big barn doors, uh, we have that into the system where we control not only a rate control system, but an attitude control system. And so it takes with uh, 70 square foot, a lot of move, just takes a small amount of change to correct any error that you might have in either CG or pitching moment. So your control mechanism is with the big elevators and also the body flap a little bit if you want to use that. Uh, the reaction control system is a rate system. And I didn't mention that in that, but we intentionally put the uh, uh, reaction control system in the wake of the vehicle, even though for orbital maneuvering we have uh, jets that are the forward firing in, but so much uncertainty in how that changes the aerodynamics in a, a surface that you, it's not a hard surface, and that interaction is, uh, you can change things in such a way that you amplify it or reduce it, and so we elected not to try to grapple with that problem and use just the aft jets, but it's just for a rate control system. In pitch, that's the distance that separated that in y'all, both on both sides, and in roll. So those, uh, the, that's that's the way. Of X-15 uh, was a low angle of attack airplane type configuration from Mach uh, 
25 to Mach 5, uh, you're flying a spacecraft kind of configuration where you basically roll about the velocity vector. Okay, you want to maintain that pitch trim and roll about the velocity vector for cross range in either direction. Now, when you begin transition, because you got to be down here when you land in, uh, you pick the best place to do that, and the best place to do that is back in the Mach uh, below five, and of course, uh, uh, and uh, above the subsonic regime. And uh, we try not to have any maneuvers that are required during that time period. Anytime you're going from a totally separated flow in the back of the vehicle, the one that is now attached, separated flow can't make up its mind sometimes. Does it want to be separated? Does it want to be attached? Not over the whole vehicle, but even on small pieces of the vehicle. And so there's uncertainties that come in there. Uh, but that's that's the area uh, that 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 you do. And, but you got to be sure. And that's where we did a lot of our PTIs. By the way, as we uh, became more and more brave uh, to get those coefficients. And it ended up the wind tunnel did a pretty good job on them. Is this an area where you are assuming that that place, yes. Okay, well, what you're doing is you're changing the Newtonian flow now my flat plate 70 square foot per surface. You mean the, the rear end? The rear end, big end, yeah. Uh -huh. So now I've got a, a normal force coefficient, so sine squared to the angle, okay. And I just change the angle up and I reduce the forces on that. And that gives me a nose up. I bring it down. That gives me a nose down. Works beautifully. This Works beautifully. Body, flap uh, body flap and elevators. Yeah, yeah both. Uh, body flap and, and aft control services. Uh, yes, sir. Talk about the, the flight test portion with yes, the aerodynamics. What sort of planes were using and, and to do that? Um, uh, the flight test was the shuttle itself. Okay. Uh, so after so we after we safely entered, you know, and everything, and then we uh, designed these pilot test inputs to extract aerodynamic characteristics. Uh, same technique that uh, Edwards developed on, and they did develop that, by the way, on the X-15 uh, and on other vehicles too. And we use that same technique. We sent uh, one of our men out and he spent about uh, uh, almost a half a year learning all their techniques, brought that back, mm -hmm. uh, developed that, uh, and uh, worked with the astronauts very, very closely. They trained for those maneuvers. We extracted data for those maneuvers. We would change the aerodynamic characteristics and not tell them what they are and see, you know, in the, in the, in the simulators and uh, make sure that we didn't get any difficulty and then make for sure that our old people could extract that data right and tell us how we changed it. They all got good A's and, <laughs> and it worked very, very well. Yeah. But those flat tests were all subsonic. Those, those, those ones where they released those shells. Uh, no, that sir. We did that one. That was for the approach and landing test. But for the entry vehicle, no, those were supersonic. And, oh, oh, yes, yes. And we did hypersonic. Tests that were done during the flights. Oh, during the, the first four flights were designated flight. orbital flight tests. And I think the PPIs actually continued well after yes, that. Oh, yeah. It was supposed yeah, to be the first one. Yeah. But, and, and actually... Technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the way... The, what this has given us in terms of a hypersonic database for, for a wind vehicle is, is incredible. The, at first, they were called pilot test inputs because the pilots were doing them automatically. And then I remember some of the pilots were saying, well, you know, you've got to do it very precisely, and so we've really got to be concentrating on that. And, and there's so many other things we have to concentrate on. Could we possibly computerize this? And so uh, I don't remember which flight they started doing that, but at that point, the PTIs became known as the program test inputs rather than the pilot test inputs. Didn't but change the acronym, but changed the meaning. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, you, you basically put in a little, little pitch up, pitch down, and see how it affected the roll and the yaw and all these cross-coupling things at, at lots of different Mach numbers. And, and, you know, over the course of a bunch of different flights and a lot of different PTIs, they really built up the, oh, yes. the, the aerodynamic coefficients at, at all these different Mach numbers. And which, which is something that, you know, we just... You, you might say a little bit about how we collected hypersonic test data in wind tunnels. Okay. I mean, it's not like you can just have a fan going and produce a Mach 20 airflow 
for 20 minutes and you can play with your little thing. Hypersonic testing was uh, done primarily at the Ames Research Center, three, uh, three and a half foot uh, facility. Uh, we also did some up at Calspan, also used some of the Langley facilities, but the real workhorse was a three and a half foot hypersonic tunnel. And basically what you do, you have the air coming through the tunnel at the required conditions. Uh, you put the uh, model of the vehicle, which is usually one and a half percent to three percent model in the facility. Facility, you have what's called a six component balance uh, that fits into the models. That's a strain gauge relationship. It gives you uh, force and moments in both directions or forces in both directions at some uh, difference between the gauges so you can pull the pitching moments and the yawing moments and the rolling moments uh, out of that. You reduce it based primarily upon dynamic pressure uh, where you say CN is equal to the normal force divided by Q. US, uh, the dynamic pressure times the reference area, standard aerodynamics, but uh, once more language kind of a thing where if you're in gas dynamics and not aerodynamics, sometimes you don't get back over to those coefficients. By the way, that in that same document, all of those terms are defined uh, pretty well. But you measure those with a balance. Then the question happens, well, I, I wasn't at full scale Reynolds number. And then that's where you come up with your theoretical techniques and you come back in and you look at it and you see that the boundary layer and the Reynolds number corrections theoretically make very little bit of difference and uh, uh, then you go through today the CFD programs you say hey it gets about the same answer you go back to the flight test data and it gets about the same answer so basically what, what you conclude is wind tunnels do a super job hypersonically for this kind of a configuration now if I've got a different kind of configured but did good on the Apollo, did good on the Gemini, did good on the Mercury, did good on the shuttle. Uh, all hypersonics, uh, man, give me that configuration. I'll tell you what the hypersonic aerodynamic characteristics are. Uh, I can tell you in phase A, and it's not going to be too much different at the end of phase B. Well, maybe you don't want to hear that, because maybe you're going to do great things in the hypersonic area, but on a blunt body, which is what we're talking about, it does a super job now. X-15, low angles of attack, flying like an airplane. Uh, Different, different story completely. Sears Hackett configuration I saw on your uh, deal there. Uh, no, I wouldn't want to use uh, just Newtonian to predict the aerodynamic characteristics hypersonically of that vehicle. On the other hand, I wouldn't want to fly it there either. Uh, it'd burn up. Okay, uh, blunt body's good. 98% of the energy goes into the shock wave. 98% uh, of the energy goes into your vehicle when you're flying low. Uh, so, uh, entry vehicles, manned entry vehicles uh, into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, uh, you're going to be flying something like a, uh, a segment of a sphere or at worst uh, uh, a raked elliptical cone. And Newtonian works good on that one too, by the way. Uh, we wind tunnel tested those for different configurations. That gets you LOD on up to a 175 rather than a one and a half. Yes, sir. Why couldn't the uh, any sort of straight wing, straight wing configuration make it a cross range requirement? Uh, the cross range requirement is primarily angle of attack oriented. Uh, the relationship between the CG payload in and payload out is a pretty good change. Uh, if you had a straight wing, uh, your straight wing can't be placed in such a way that it trims subsonically and trims hypersonically. Now, it can at higher angles of attack with less L over D, you can make it work. But down at 45 degrees, you end up with a, a delta wing configuration. Uh, does that answer your question? And, and it's, that's a good exercise, though, but you can go through it uh, on a couple of sheets of paper, okay, and and say ah, because you hypersonically you, you got that CG, you got your CP, uh, you know where it's got to be placed. You get down low angles of attack, you know where your CP is for that body, you know your CP is up at the quarter card, and you know you got four and a half CGs. 
it, it, it just doesn't quite work. It, it takes a delta to do that. So it was more seizure related than heating? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, all, although we had a, the, the one that we mentioned, the 200 nautical mile cross range with a straight wing, uh, Langley did some tests on that even at high angle of attack and right in that where that straight wing ties back into the uh, uh, fuselage, uh, super high heating rates, but we could put little fillets in there and, and overcome that heating particular uh, thing. Uh, but if you're going to go real fast, uh, <laughs> delta wings look better. <laughs> all right. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you were doing all this aerodynamic analysis, uh, did you consider a perfect surface, or did you also do tests or analysis? In uh, good, good question. What if the TPS fails. Good question. Uh, first of all, is we have an external insulator, and Bob Reed will talk to you about that, and Tom Mosher probably has too, which meant that uh, uh, our uh, main aluminum surface, which we want to keep quite cool, uh, is uh, different than the one that we initially designed. Uh, we went back in, made models that simulated those differences, made calculations that simulated those differences, there were very small corrections uh, that needed to be made. Now, then the other question that you had is suppose you lose a piece of TPS, which we did. Right? We, we lost some chunks of TPS early in the program, and uh, uh, we uh, you can't do much testing on that because it's so little bitty and, you know, it's like a grease pencil kind of a thing. But you go back in and uh, we make for a first approach we take some maximum things the pressure can't be greater than total and it can't be less than zero okay and so let's put those deltas into that area and into a nice area around there and see if it makes any difference to the aerodynamic coefficients and they're quite small and so we feel quite comfortable with that now from a heating different answer uh, but from an aerodynamic standpoint does it affect the aerodynamics uh, uh, we, we scope it in that way yeah. It's a pretty small area. Yes, sir. Where was the greatest risk on the aerodynamic design? Uh, during the first flight, was there anything you were particularly concerned about? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you know, getting it right. Uh, uh, I guess uh, my biggest pucker, pucker factor is in the transitional phase. Uh, I've just seen so many things go wrong transonically uh, that the transonic wind tunnels miss. Uh, uh, it's a dynamic situation where you're you're, you're moving, uh, and and that that was my my personally my greatest concern is did we get that right? We did everything we could, and it turned out that we did a good job. But I worried about that. Uh, more than anything else. Launch vehicle, uh, primarily did we get the uh, structural loads right and did we put enough margin and uh, we, we did not use uncertainties in the pressure distributions. We couldn't really figure out how to do that. Uh, if you change, we had to have balanced loads. And if you said, well, my CP can be higher or lower, uh, do you put it higher over the whole vehicle or higher here and lower there? And then you've got unbalanced loads. Uh, uh, but we did uh, measure the wing bending moments, wing shears, wing torsion, and also the attached loads in those. And so we put some uncertainties on those. And you know, Tom's already been here. I don't know if he mentioned how they tried to handle those, but uh, at least they had some uh, of those things, we, but we never figured out how to put uncertainties in pressure distributions and still be able to get all the balance loads for Nastran. Maybe, maybe one of y'all are sharp enough to figure out how to do something like that. Uh, but that was the one on the ascent is uh, uh, had we really adequately uh, covered the uncertainties in pressure distributions with the way that we accomplished that by the uncertainties in uh, uh, bending moments, torsion, and shear. Let's uh, let's take a couple minute break and, uh, and then we can resume with questions. I'm going to go down to my office and get one or two things which I think will be interesting and we can also talk about. So thank you. A minute or two. Yes. Uh, 
instead of one configuration, you've got one configuration times five degrees, 10 degrees, minus five degrees. These split down the middle, same way here, body flat. So you've got one, two, three, four, five times five. You've got five different configurations, 25 different configurations versus one. And so it means more testing, but you're using the same facility. It just means more hours of wind tunnel time, more hours of plotting and looking and yeah. and uh, uh, so that that's 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 the difference. Uh, say a, a few words about how you did the systems engineering or the systems integration between the aerodynamics and the flight control system, the structure, and so forth. I'm ready to flight control system. All right. Then let's take flight control system. Uh, uh, we in our division were responsible for aerodynamics and flight dynamics and flight dynamics wasn't very well defined. Uh, the avionics division was responsible for the GN and C system control system and also flight dynamics. Okay, so now, uh, so you got to work together, and you're going to get in one another's bailiwick. That's that's part of good systems engineering. You you're going to do what the other fellow is going to redo, and he's going to do what you're going to redo. Uh, but our responsibility was was twofold. As one is we had to have the right aerodynamic characteristics. But before we had the right aerodynamic characteristics, we had to have a configuration that should be able to live with the GN and C system. Okay, so the way we accomplish that is Ken Cox. Is Ken going to be here with you? No. Not, okay. Ken Cox was uh, head of the uh, uh, avionics and GN and C system. He gave us a functional GN and C system. Didn't have all the strings in it. Didn't have all of the uh, relays and all of the stuff there. But if we gave it a command to change that we knew how much it would change and how long it would take it to change an elevator position as a for instance and so that was called a functional GN and C system it did the right functions but it didn't do it the same method that the real GN and C system did so we would take our aerodynamics and see that it would work and we'd be able to make the maneuvers that were required and we would analyze it and we'd be pretty satisfied that with those aerodynamics and with the variations that we were okay then but that didn't say the system was okay that just said that hey we had a pretty high probability of making work then we sent that aerodynamic database and all this is happening not you know ship it throw it over the fence but over a period of time we sent them the aerodynamic characteristics with the variations and then they beat it bloody flying everything they can think of with their GN and C system and fortunately uh, that worked out pretty well he'd pick up a few things but not anything major so we didn't well, we didn't have any and by the way this is the only vehicle I know that happened that way on the orbiter we didn't have any major configuration changes that we had to make uh, once we got well into the program it, it stayed the same that we had no the hydraulic system. Uh, yeah, that's right yes and and that that was 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 true that whole thing is to uh, not only the GN and C system but the hydraulics is when you give it the command when you say okay I want a Delta theta of so much or Delta e of so much that it takes it about a quarter of a second to get there uh, between the that's a, and that's a long time on a lag time when you pile all those things in to end up. Uh, now structure is much the same way is uh, they gave us load indicators where they said hey we can take so much wind shear so much wind torsion so much wind bending so much uh, punch loads into the tank from the attach point in the front so much punch loads into the tank on the back end uh, SRB and uh, we have all the gambling that's where we're doing the flight performance calculations through the wind shears and the wind gust and we assure ourselves that we don't violate any of the load indicators but that does not say the vehicle's safe. Then GN and C flies that one through that, gives all those conditions back over to the structures people, and they analyze the hound out of it. Okay, they, they look at all the cracks and crevices. And, and if you got people that don't have a cooperative spirit, it won't work. It just doesn't work. So you gotta learn how to get along with your buddies over on the other side. Uh, don't don't build your fiefdom up that your wall so big and you control your own destiny because you don't. And and we 
we had a super group of people to work with, uh, and and to me that's what really really made it work. Same thing on heating, by the way. Uh, they'd give us uh, heating indicators, and uh, we'd file the jacket. That was a little more straightforward, where they'd give us the Q dot locals to Q dot references, and we'd look through all the Q dot references, and we'd give them all the final set of trajectories, and they would analyze it in detail. But uh, uh, it's uh, uh, I look at it like here, here's a problem, and I can work it like a piece of pie and go on this problem, go all the way down to the center, then go over and eat this piece and this piece. Doesn't work that way. You start around the edges and, and you, you cycle in on it. And, and finally you get to the, you eat all the pie, but 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 you, 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 you accomplish it around the edges first and work out your bigger problems and then get down to the smaller problem. Is that? Yeah, and I think Bass, I think the important part too is that no matter what system you work on, whether you work on the Apollo or you work on the shuttle or whether you work on the new CEV, you're going to basically have to go through the same, Absolutely. maybe simpler or harder, but you're going to have to go through the same process. Yeah. Yes, that is absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, sir. You said there was no major configuration changes later on in the program, but is there anything that you felt you were kind of stuck with, like I wish we could change this, like the, not having the Ohm's pods stick out in the back like that, was that a problem for no, we lost uh, increased drag a little bit, but not enough to, to, to hurt anything. Uh, now, uh, and the aerodynamics didn't bother me any that my L over D went down by 0 .001. Uh, but now the fellows that were flying it, uh, they, they got in there and they, they said, yeah, hey, I can still go around the hack and I can still do all the things I want to. And uh, But all that, all that was done. Uh, uh, once more systems integration, uh, you got to include the crew in it. Uh, GNSC system doesn't bother them in it. Arrow doesn't bother them. Structure doesn't bother them. But you still got to fly it. And uh, uh, Dr. Gilroy said, <laughs> what he, he said, you don't want the pilots talking bad about your airplanes in the bars. <laughs> so keep your crew happy. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, to answer your question, uh, no, uh, not not really. Uh, to do meet the requirements. Uh, it's going to look pretty much the same. If, if I designed it today, you know, okay, let's go back and same requirements now. Uh, you give me a different set of requirements, it's not going to look the same. That's one argument we did have earlier in the program. I've changed it. Some people wanted to put some canards on the... <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, canards. Uh, that's not a that joke. Was, that that's was uh, done, but it was a big argument. <laughs> Canard is an aerodynamic surface part of the center of gravity. And, and the beneficial part, let me tell you the good parts about canard. Uh, canards, uh, subsonically, uh, I can give a pitch up moment and increase my lift. Uh, if it's only after the vehicle, when I give a, uh, a pitch up moment, I decrease my lift. Ah, so canards are wonderful. But what canards do is it fouls up the flow over all of the rest of your vehicle. And uh, so I've got a total unsteady. Back, back to here, I've got one configuration. Unsteady aerodynamics, heating, uh, fixed configuration. I put a canard out there. Now I've got two more configurations, three more configurations, four more, five more, six more. And uh, it, it, it does a lot of grief with vortexes and stuff like that. Now, if you had to have it, uh, you have to have it. Uh, Concord had to have it, okay. And, but that didn't mean the shuttle had to have it. It operated fine without canard. So no, I, I sure wouldn't put canards on there uh, if we had another shot in it. Yes, ma'am. Faster or cheaper to design a shuttle in the States compared to 20 years ago? Yes, good question, John. Maybe. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Okay. Uh, with the tools we have uh, and the foreknowledge that we have, having been there before, uh, absolutely yes. Uh, and I don't want to be negative, but you don't have the cooperative spirit going on that you had then. I don't know why either. The, the, the young engineers are sharper. They know no ifs, ands, or buts. Y'all know a whole lot more. Uh, 
than I ever knew. Uh, but uh, you don't get along as well. Uh, you know, this is my. I don't need you here. I don't want you here. Get out of here. I'm going to do it my way. And, and that's just an observation I made. It might, might be that, you know, my knot hole is, is too restricted. Uh, but it goes up to pretty high management, too, not just at the working level. A second thing is uh, I, they asked me to come in and consult with them, and uh, they had lost technical capability, didn't use any engineers much after uh, a certain time on the shuttle, and then after the last accident, uh, they would bring the engineers in, and they say, uh, I've never looked at that. I, I, you know, I'm on the payroll, but I, so the capability was 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 greatly lacking. And so we developed some ways to bring them up to speed in about a year and a half period of time, which, which happened. Uh, observation. Uh, by the way, I was pleased that all y'all got to class on time. I, I told management to send them to ethics school. Now, if there's a meeting and you tell somebody you'll be there at that time, you'll be there at that time. Okay. If you tell somebody you'll make a deliverable at that time, you make a deliverable at that time. Be a man, a woman of your word. Uh, and I, I found that lacking. I don't know that ethics school helped too much that we sent them all to. Uh, well, I know it did, it did too, because the first, the second day of class, there was, uh, I think, 10 of them late, and he sent them back and wouldn't let them in the class. <laughs> but, but, but learn or whatever, get along with folks. They're your friends. They're your buddies. They're going to be there for a lifetime. And yeah, you're going to have some grief. And yeah, he'll give you some headaches or she'll give you some headache. But y'all are all on the same team and, and, and work hard towards that. And I know you got to grit your teeth and spit sometimes, but, but, but that, that's major. Uh, yeah. That didn't cost you anything. About the wind tunnel testing, firstly, could you reduce that now with CFD? And secondly, um, uh, you showed there were several hundred tests yes. and um, several tens of thousands of hours. Yes. So does that mean each test ran for several hundred hours? Uh, some tests ran for hundreds of hours. That was the total number of hours for all those tests, not a per hour basis. But yeah, there were some hundred hour tests that went on. Uh, answer your question, does CFD reduce the number of wind tunnel hours? Uh, three areas that uh, we're working in right now that uh, uh, one reason is to bring the engineers up to technical speed where they can stand up and be counted and you can ask them a technical question. They can give you a technical answer and say this is my analysis and this is how I got that. To do that, uh, we recommended back to Johnson Spacecraft Center that uh, you better get your engineers knowing how to do wind tunnel tests. You've got to get them to know how to make their calculations to run these programs. You've got to be able to do all that. That's your integration contractor. They need to have that capability and they've done that. Okay, and they really came up to speed. In the midst of that, they've also increased the CFD capabilities, and I'm very envious of, of what you can do with CFD. However, <laughs> it hasn't decreased the amount of runs that they're requesting. It's increased the amount of runs that they're requesting because they'll do this little bitty analysis, and here's the cable tray going down that, and they say, does it go sonic under the cable tray? Well, I don't know. What is the wind tunnel test data? Well, uh, we, we just have a data point here and a data point here and our CFD shows that it can go sonic under there. All we need to test that to make for sure that's there. <laughs> and so I, I, it could but I don't think it will. Uh, I think the, the, the better your tools get in, you want to make for sure they're right. Now one day, uh, uh, one day I, I think yes, that's going to happen. But right now uh, there's still a lot of question. Even in the CFDers mind, am I really right? Am I really right? And uh, uh, they've always been accused of, uh, they can tell you what the right answer is if you give it to them. Uh, and and uh, that's, that's really not true any longer. That was for a number of years. But they really, that CFD is so great. And they use Overflow, by the way, as the one that's primarily the big workhorse right now. And it does a super job. Is there a question? Uh, uh, 
All right. Any other question? I'd like to address the question that was asked about the easier part, or easier. Let me not. Uh, uh, let me not talk necessarily about the shuttle, but let me talk about uh, uh, Apollo for a moment. I mentioned it before. In Apollo, we went to the uh, we went to the moon with uh, a single string avionics system. We had one IMU, one computer uh, on the command and service module. We had uh, one service propulsion system to get you out of lunar orbit or to get you into lunar orbit. And uh, I think today it will be very difficult to uh, do that. I think you're probably going to have to uh, have multiple, str multiple strings. Uh, you're going to have an, uh, an escape system, an all-up escape system. So I think in that context, it may be more difficult. I do think the tools you have today will make it easier. But I do think what we know today is just like uh, Bass said on the understanding a little bit about the aerodynamics, you want more. It's going to be, I think in some respects, my comment is that the next time we go to the moon, we're going to find out how hard it really was. Because I do think it's going to be hard to do. At least that's my personal feeling, and I think a lot of people agree with me. One of the toughest decisions we ever made in the space program, and Bass and I were talking about it at breakfast, is when we decided to do Apollo 8. Apollo 8 was probably the most fantastic mission that we ever came up with. That was the first time we left the influence of Earth's gravity. We went into orbit around the uh, moon, and we got out of orbit. And we didn't land on the moon, but we did everything we, we had to do uh, for the first time. And I think that was probably the boldest decision uh, the Na NASA and the government ever made. And again, I look back, and I'm not sure how we would make that decision today. It was pretty tough. And of course, one man led that attack was uh, George Low, who was deputy, who was manager of the Apollo program office at Johnson Space Center, then became deputy administrator, and then became pre uh, uh, president of uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. But that was really a fantastic uh, project. I'll, I'll comment on uh, the programs that I, I worked on: dinosaur aerodynamics and dinosaur, which was uh, defunct. Air Force manned spacecraft program. I worked on Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Blue Gemini. Uh, and each time I go on to the next program and learn more, I say, we sure were lucky. Uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, I was telling you about these new young engineers now that are up to speed, where they didn't want to say anything, and now that they're crunching numbers, they got a lot of criticism for the way we did it, <laughs> and rightfully so. Uh, a lot of capability that's there, and you're going to have more capability today than you had yesterday, and more capability on the next program than you had on the last program. You're going to find some things to do and be able to do it better than the last program was done. Uh, that's both good news and bad news. Uh, the, bad news is it'll cost you more to do it and the good news is it'll be done a whole lot better <laughs> all right any other question I thought it, it might be interesting just to make sure you you really have an understanding of of what the shuttle has to do to sort of take them through the entry and maybe Bass you'll make some comments about the aerodynamics I'll talk a little bit about the operations um, you know, you're you're in orbit, a couple hundred miles above the ground, um, and the the first thing that you do, you, you basically put the orbiter after you get everything stowed and ready ready for entry. Uh, you put the orbiter, so you're essentially going backwards, face to the ground, and you you burn the uh, Ohm's engines, and just in terms of redundancy, we've got two engines. Uh, you can cross feed the the fuel that's inside the ohms pod. You can cross feed from one side to the other. So even if you lose one ohms engine, you can still do a deorbit burn just on the other engine. Of course, you'll you'll have to um, turn a little bit so that you can burn through the CG. 
If you lose both Ohm's engines, you can cross feed the propellant into the reaction control system, aft jets, and you can come back using those. And if you're having a real bad day and, and you run out of you, well, if you, you know, you might have a fuel leak, for instance, you, and, and so you don't have enough propellant back there. We actually, there, there was a procedure where you actually then would flip over and burn the remainder of your forward RCS propellant to just slow yourself down as much as you can. We never had to do that. In fact, I don't think we ever lost an Ohm's engine. So, but, but we practice all these things. So anyway, uh, the point is one way or the other, you, uh, you slow yourself down down until, you know, here's the Earth, here's your orbit. Th this is grossly out of scale. You, you realize that on the scale, on this scale, your, your orbit is actually about like that, okay? But in any case, so you do your burn just enough to lower your perigee just about to ground level. Uh, and now you're essentially in, in free fall, which, which, I mean, you're in free fall in, in orbit, but now you're gradually getting closer to the Earth. And so what, what you do is you now flip over and you put yourself in a position where when you actually hit the top upper reaches of the atmosphere and about 400,000 feet is what we call entry interface. Uh, and actually, um, the flight control system changes at that point, and the, the computer actually goes into a different mode. So at this point, you're now at a 40 degree uh, angle. Uh, and as Bass said, that, that gives you your, your blunt uh, surface is, is approaching. And uh, you know, basically, the, the sensors feel the deceleration. And that's, that's really how you know where you are in the entry. You, you sense the deceleration. That tells you what the dynamic pressure is. Um, during the early part of the entry, all of your control is by the reaction control system because you don't have enough dynamic pressure on the aerodynamic surfaces to be effective. Um, as you get down further and further into the atmosphere, uh, let's see, I think when the number that comes to mind is 10, I assume that's 10 pounds per square yes, foot yes. dynamic pressure, is when the ailerons become effective. And so you, you have what's called a blended control system. So, uh, you know, the first thing that, that you can do is actually control your roll. And so you, you disable the, uh, the roll jets and you enable the ailerons, but the pitch and the yaw is still controlled by the, by the RCS. And the critical thing, uh, like, like Bass was saying, is you've got to keep your angle of attack constant with respect to your velocity vector because your, your aerodynamic heating depends on that. If you get down to too low an angle, now you're going to heat the, the, the surfaces, the upper part of the orbiter, and you're going to burn up. Okay, so you're controlling your angle around the velocity vector, and now you can you can move about that. You, you have a lift vector, okay? Um, and now the, the, the whole name of the game, because remember, this is a glider. And so energy control is what's absolutely essential to make sure that, you know, you got to end up at the threshold of the runway at about, we said we were aiming for 150 knots. We, we never That's actually made it. Yeah. It, it, it. It was actually, actually about 200 knots it was the, the touchdown speed. But pretty good anyway. <laughs> we got close. Um, so, you know, at every phase of your entry, uh, knowing your energy and controlling it is critical. So, uh, for instance, if, if you were, uh, for whatever reason, your, your burn didn't go right and, and you're, you, you think you're going to be short of the runway, um, we, we notched down the angle of attack just a little bit. I think it was to about 38 degrees was about the, the lowest you could, you could safely go. And you, and you keep your lift vector, you basically fly, would fly the entire entry with your lift vector uh, going away from the Earth. And that maximizes your, your range. But you actually target the entry so that you have more energy than you need because it's a lot easier to bleed off energy than somehow to, to get it back, especially when you don't have any engines. 
So what you what you normally do then is you will basically do a, a roll maneuver and you'll be rolling so that your angle of attack with respect to your velocity vector is always 40 degrees, but essentially you're rolling around the velocity vector. So you can now point your lift over to the side. And if, for instance, um, if you didn't um, have enough propellant when you were burning, and so now you're, you actually have too much energy, uh, what you're going to do, you, or, or for instance, if you have a lot of cross range that you have to make up, you could spend your entire entry over on your side like this. And in fact, there was even a, a case which we would simulate if, if your if your entry burn if if you have an underburn and you, you, now you have too much energy you have to really get rid of a lot of energy you could actually roll 180 degrees and and enter, that that would be pretty sporty and again nobody's ever had to do that but but we did simulate and I don't I don't know you know what what you would make of the aerodynamics coming in but but the the point is we we try to. Uh, uh, you know, allow you, you have a basic design that you're working with, and then you try to develop operational procedures to make the system work in as many contingencies as possible. So anyway, that's that's the deal. You basically are rolling around the the, the velocity vector to control both your energy and your your cross range until let's see. Then at at, uh, at 20 uh, psf, uh, your your ailerons. Uh, your, your, uh, the, the elevons actually get pitch effectivity, and so you, you disable the pitch jets, and now both the, the pitch and the roll are controlled by the, the elevons. The, the vertical stabilizer, as you can see, is in the shadow, and so actually you don't get yaw effectivity out of the vertical stabilizer until just about transonic and subsonic, when you actually do the final pitch over to get ready for the going into the heading alignment circle. And, and that's why sometimes if you've seen pictures of the shuttle as it approaches the landing at Kennedy Space Center, you'll see little plumes come out the side, and that's the, the yaw jets and the RCS, which, uh, RCS, which are still firing, because it's still supersonic when it, when it gets over the, the Space Center. And, and you can actually, if you're on the ground, you hear this double sonic boom, which is, which is pretty impressive, because I guess you get one from the front and one from the back of the vehicle, so it's a blah, blah. As, and then it goes around. Um, so that's, uh, you know, and, and then of course you're, you're flying, you hit the atmosphere at Mach 25, and so you're going through this entire aerodynamic regime down to, uh, hi, through hypersonic, supersonic, transonic, subsonic. Uh, and I remember um, Max Faget gave us a little talk about how the aerodynamic coefficients, I mean, you, you were talking about how we had to get it, but they change at, at different Mach numbers, right? And so, uh, you know, there was a, the, the and, and we, we mentioned this before, you know, why you really need a fly-by-wire system on, on this vehicle, because the control laws that you're using to, um, you know, to do a, a, a roll maneuver at, uh, at Mach 15 are, are different from doing a roll maneuver at Mach 8. Um, these program test inputs, you can hardly see them. I mean, you, you really didn't feel them. They were just a, a couple of degrees, you know, that, that you would move the stick, you know, psh, 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 you know, just little things. But that collected enough data uh, to, to get a much better determination of these coefficients. You're very sensitive to things like, you know, beta angle, you know, probably about two degrees. I, yep. You know, if you go okay. off more than that, and that's actually when you read the detailed description of of the loss of Columbia, you know when they had a, a penetration of the uh, the forward edge of the of the wing, and that disturbed the airflow, and so they were actually uh, the the control system was was fighting you know a, a really valiant fight to keep Columbia on target, and and it you know they were they, they could see that on the ground the, there was there was more. Uh, air aerodynamic surface activity and the RCS jets kicked in. 
in the end, of course, you run out of control authority, um, and and the vehicle eventually diverged, and it actually broke up aerodynamically. It, you know, it was not an explosion. It it just it, it broke up aerodynamically. Well, the hot gases in the wing were uh, were disrupting the airflow, and, and eventually the wing was slumping, and and you know so things were just getting worse and worse. And, and I, I I don't know exactly what went f first. You know, pieces were falling off along the way. But the point, and the, the same thing if if you read the uh, you know the analysis of the Challenger accident accident on a, a second by second basis, you know you'll see that the the main engines were adjusting their thrust and trying to trying to keep it you know the the system was was really uh, really working hard to just doing what it was supposed to do essentially um, the, the flight control system was trying to keep it within the control boundaries and, and eventually it ran out of muscle because of the other failures and and once you go to a you know a bad beta angle or angle of attack the the vehicle breaks up aerodynamically Ask the aerodynamic coefficients. Um, you might say a word about the aerodynamic coefficients and which ones were the hardest to uh, determine and how they were aware of. Okay. Uh, basically, aerodynamic coefficients are normal forces, side forces, uh, rolling moments, yawing moments, pitching moments, and those that change that, like elevators and body flaps and rudders and speed brakes. Uh, the uh, coefficients uh, uh, that the biggest errors, uh, the biggest variations are in the low supersonic to transonic speed regimes, uh, primarily in the control variables. Uh, the biggest ones were just before transition or any time that the elevators were in an up position where the flow couldn't quite decide whether to be attached or separated. That's that, and so you want to avoid that. Digging down, not very much variations in those at all. But coming in the up position, pretty big variations in the rolling moments and yawing moments due to those. Uh, we try to avoid those, of course, and. Uh, henceforth with the CG location, uh, but those were the ones that we probably uh, uh, were the toughest and we tried to stay away from. Uh, overall, um, hypersonics right on, subsonics second best, uh, transonic uh, the most difficult, low supersonic, uh, kind of in between there. The coefficients, uh, it's hard to talk about them on a percentage basis because CM is zero and a delta CM is an infinite percentage. Uh, so uh, you, you can't really talk about them on a percentage basis. Uh, but uh, uh, when you look at the plots like CM versus alpha, uh, very small variation after we got through with the flight test program. Before we got through the flight test program, uh, uh, we probably uh, cut the variations in half uh, on change like pitching moments, yawing moments, and rolling moments. Uh, we did better than that on the uh, pitching moments, yawing moments, and rolling moments due to elevator positions uh, when they're at lower local angles of attack and uh, those were cut uh, quite uh, significantly uh, with the PTIs. Uh, but there's still, even today, uh, you don't just have one coefficient at one angle of attack, one angle of side slip that you evaluate. You evaluate that one plus the variation that's about it. And I remember one of the, the big activities in the simulators uh, before the first flight, uh, they would have the, the test flight crews who were going to make these flights would be flying entries, and they would actually vary the, co the aerodynamic coefficients. And you could always, you know, if you, if you put in a big enough variation, you know, three sigma in all of the parameters and they went in the wrong direction, you could always make it impossible to, uh, to have a success 
successful entry. And so it was a real question where the managers, and Aaron, maybe you have something to say about that. You and Chris Kraft yeah. had to really make the decision when when you knew enough and yeah. when you could fly safely. You're going to hear Chris Kraft talk uh, sharply, and that's going to be an interesting thing for you. And I remember after we landed on the first mission, there were a lot of people saying that the shuttle wasn't going to work. All the towels were going to come off, the flight control system. The flight control system was a big issue because of the aerodynamics, and there were certainly there. And that the flight control system, the aerodynamics, wasn't going to work. Now, if you've ever been to the Johnson Space Center for the control room, uh, uh, but I was sitting at the console with Chris Kraft, and he got on the net and said, because there were a lot of criticism. A lot of people wrote letters and showed them the crash the first flight and to make it. And he got on the net and said, we're infinitely smarter today. And uh, I guess that summarized it. Uh, we were infinitely smarter. Mm -hmm. We did design a good uh, system. And uh, I think that's about, uh, that about summed it up. But we were infinitely smarter. Questions. Yeah. Well, actually, it's an operational question. Okay. So I'm just wondering if the if the entire crew is trained on the whole landing procedure. No, no. We have we have two pilots, just like okay. you know, in any airplane. Um, some of the uh, people who flew f center seat as flight engineers were trained pilots, and I would have been quite comfortable if they had landed the shuttle. But you know, how many how many failures do you? you prepare for you know if, if we have two people on board who are trained to uh, to land um, you know I always thought to myself we also have this auto land software which nobody's ever used but you know if if somehow all the other six people were, were incapacitated and, and it was just me I push the auto auto land sequence and, and and all you have to all you have to do is you have to put the gear down manually and I know how to do that uh, but but you know landing the shuttle is is really uh, it's it's very complicated and you know it's it, they, they train hundreds and hundreds of hours in the simulator they have uh, you know someday if, if you, we, we could spend and, uh, you know a whole session talking about the shuttle training aircraft you know it's one thing to to land in the in the simulator but nobody's ever died in a simulator number one and number two you, you know you're looking at a TV screen you're not actually looking out at the runway you don't feel the bumpy aerodynamics and, and so they they developed a shuttle training aircraft which is the Gulf Stream 2 um, very heavily modified it's actually a flying simulator Simulator, you know your final approach because your your L over D on on this vehicle is I don't know what it is exactly about five maybe five. I think five yeah. Yeah. yeah so you're coming in at a, about a 20 degree approach angle which may not seem like a lot but you know a commercial airplane comes in about three degrees so when you you know it. Uh, and the problem is you, you take a regular airplane and, and you point it down at a 20 degree angle and, and your airspeed is going to go above your red line. So you've got to make enough drag to simulate the shuttle. So that what, you know, there's, there's computers inside this uh, shuttle training aircraft. The left seat is set up to be just like the shuttle cockpit, and when the uh, when the pilot makes the maneuvers, it basically goes back into the computers, and then they work the flight control system of of the Gulf Stream to make the Gulf Stream fly like the shuttle. The only way that they can produce enough drag to make it go at a, a constant speed at, at a 20 degree angle is you you have full speed brakes, your gear is down, and you know engines have the, the, you have thrust reverses you run your engines in reverse after you're on the runway to slow yourself down well in the Gulf Stream they run their engines at 90% reverse thrust while they're flying in the air so it's it's an extraordinary vehicle and I'll tell you when I you know I've, I've flown it in the center seat just to see and it, and it you know you may be 
flying on this angle, but it looks like you're flying. <laughs> it's, it, it's really uh, it extraordinary. Looks like you're flying that way. It really does. Um, just one thing to, to uh, remind you. Uh, a week from today, we've asked for the initial report outline plus uh, some reference materials. So what we want to get a sense is, uh, you know, what are your plans? What What's the scope of what you're going to be looking at? What what are you going to deal with? And, uh, you know, I hope by this time that, that you've located some reference materials you're going to be using. Um, and the idea, we'll, we'll be sort of spiraling in on this. So the idea is, you know, we'll take a look at what your plans are, uh, and then we can work together. And if, you're, if you have some questions or you're having difficulties, this gives us an opportunity to, to talk about it and make sure you're on the right track so that you'll be doing something that you, know, you can be proud of and that, that you'll actually learn something from. So that's, that's due a week from today. Um, it would be useful for me to have those electronically so that I can send them to Professor Cohn for him to look at. Um, I'm happy to accept hard copy as well, but I, but I do want them electronically. Any questions? Have a good weekend. Well, thank Matt.